Hey, Larry, are we ready to start streaming? Well, we got a few seconds, so I'm just making sure we're all ready to go. <laughs> okay, it's five o'clock. Just let us know when. Uh... Okay. Miss Loop, you're taking this one. Okay, perfect. So we would like to go ahead and start with our pre-meeting. Um, our first item is going to be the social media policy discussion. Um, Ms. Strickland, you're going to be doing the presentation today? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, board. I'm just here to give an overview of the two policies that are on the um, on your radar um, for decision in a, in a bit. So there are two policies actually, and so I'm just gonna briefly touch on both of them that you received in full, I believe it was Thursday of last week. So the first one, just our general um, social media policy, just talks about how we use social media, um, how we use it, why we use it, and we felt like there needed to be a more robust policy um, to just make sure that we are following our own guidelines and following um, case law that's out there now. So basically one section um, deals with the official use of social media by town policies, by town employees, and it really just encourages town employees and lays out ways that we conduct ourselves as administrators of the site, making sure that we know what the policies are and that we follow the policies of the town and that we do not um, express views on our town sites that are personal, but they are professional and represent the town well. Another section talks about what is strictly prohibited on the uses of social media. It is some of the information that you know would be more common sense, but we wanted to make sure that was put in writing. Obviously, we would never want to use any town site for disclosure of confidential information, non-public information, which is different, legally protected, or anything that might be related to criminal investigations. So this section deals um, with a lot more specifics in what you received, but basically what not to do on town sites. Then there is a section on the personal use of social media by town employees, and really just reminding employees that if you're using your personal social media sites, please do not be out there representing um, the town with your comments, and also to make sure that they are aware that as public employees, um, our use of social media is um, an extension of our workplace, and we need to be careful that we represent ourselves and the town well. And then we have a, a policy which was adapted. Um, Attorney Sloop and I worked on it. It's a model policy from the School of Government, UNC School of Government, as well as some adopted policies from other um, local municipalities. Wanted to make sure that what we put on all of our sites is consistent. So because we do allow public comments, we consider it a moderated site, we do allow comments and we want to make sure that the comments that are on there and the people who use them understand the difference between communicating with their friends and communicating with the government entity. So it does talk about the views that are expressed by those who make a comment, are not the views of the town. Obviously, um, people may not be aware that they have no expectation of privacy when they're publishing. Hopefully, they know that on a public social media site. But the thing that most people aren't aware is that the pe public records requirement that must be met by government entities applies to them as well. Our policies will be amended um, and modified whenever needed, and that is one reason this policy was brought up. And strongly would encourage, and these are things we would point out, for people not to use social media sites to report um, emergency communications. I know those who are in law enforcement and first responders regularly comment about when people say, can you come, I'm concerned, or there's a problem in my backyard at 2 a.m., they're sending a message through a, a messenger or through a social media site is not the same as contacting 911. So, all of the policies and the comments for this is to ho hopefully to help people understand that's not the proper way to contact for emergency um, services. Now this is a lot of words on this slide, the rules of use, but this is what will be, if adopted, placed on every social media platform the town has. It basically just does point out it is a moderated site. 
It is subject to public records laws. It needs to be related to things associated with the town. We cannot address issues that are not under our purview. Um, we will not allow um, profanity or obscene language. Thank goodness most social media sites have a profanity filter and can do that for us. Um, other things that are, if it's discriminatory in nature, solicitations of commerce, if it's a p political of nature, if it's illegal, infringement on intellectual property, um, confidential, all of those things, while we may understand that that would be proper discourse, some don't. So by placing all of this on our sites, um, it does give us the right to help moderate the site but still allow public comments. And the last sentence on that slide, the town reserves the right to hide, block, or remove um, if they violate these guidelines. So you have to have guidelines published in order to help people understand what they are. But we also want to point out that all of these, if they're hidden, blocked, or removed, are still retained due to public records laws. So that is a piece of social media that we have that we're just trying to make the um, policy more robust and more um, all-inclusive. Any questions on the first section? That's the general. Yes, ma'am. So was it saying age and three or older? I thought that was kind of. Yeah, because it's like, so if somebody's 39, you can say something. Or if you don't like teenagers, that's OK. So I didn't know how that age was determined. I agree that it's not good to discriminate against someone regardless of their age, whether it be young age or old age. Could we just change it to say age? If the town directs us to, we could make that change. Town board. Yes, sir. Thank you, Kim, for your presentation. It was, it was well uh, presented. I appreciate the information. I have two questions. Uh, when you were going over the uh, transferring of information from like law enforcement and calling 911, like the, we had a case today, police put out, you know, we got a tree down on mm -hmm. Hambright. And, you know, I picked that up and I put that out socially. Is that, can we continue to do that? Yes, sir. And my follow up question is. Your last sentence is here, the town reserves the right to hide, block, and remove comments. Who's the person that monitors that? Actually, it would fall to me okay. into part of the policy um, as the administrator of the policy. Any, if it was a legal question, obviously I would refer to our legal staff. But um, the guidelines that are put in place, because it, I will talk more about the, the elected officials policy. But what is it's not appropriate for a moderated site for a government entity is to delete people because they disagree with you. And so by putting the guidelines in place, it allows us to say we can do certain things if you don't meet these guidelines, but we still hold everything due to public records so that we're in compliance with North Carolina law. Kim, if you don't mind, I would like to reiterate that we did take these rules of use from a model policy that the UNC School of Government put forth. So when we're deciding on what will be hidden, blocked, or removed, it's based off of what's listed here, if it falls into any one of those categories, not if it's disagreeing or anything yes. like that? OK. Anyone else have any questions, comments up to this point? OK. OK. So moving forward with a different policy. And this, when we say public officials, this is for town board, appointed commissions, committees, any um, group that is representing the town of Huntersville. So this is slightly different, but again, an overview. You received the full policy last week. So the top three risk areas for public officials, there should be no surprise on some of those um, items up there. Just want to say within the last I would maybe four years, there's been quite a bit of case study on First Amendment and um, viewpoint discrimination. So there's some case law out there now that there did not used to be. So for an elected or a public official, it's very important that if you maintain a social media account, that you are prepared for the disagreements that come with that and that you do not um, do some that you don't hide or delete things because you disagree or, or as engaging with the public, 
you're going to obviously not um, maybe see eye to eye on everything, but there are some pretty strict case law now, and there have been cases that have been settled um, involving governors, board members, well, as well U.S. presidents, um, where there have been some issues with social media just because of um, removing content or saying content hasn't been there. So there is case law now so that just please as a reminder as an elected official or as a public official that um, you have to be aware of that people have the First Amendment right to, to state things um, and so be prepared for that. Um, the second one is more, it's the burden of staff, but anything that you do in social media, because it is still a communication of town business, is a public record. And that's really been pushed and enforced more lately. So we just, part of this um, policy is just to make you aware that what you do on social media is also a public record. It is no different than you emailing a staff member or emailing someone, or a constituent, someone in the area. And then I, I don't think I need to explain number three, but I will just say you're entitled to your political views, but reference point one on that one, just so. Okay, so from a staffing perspective, we're more concerned with this slide. Now of the six that are up there, while I think most of them are, are very self-explanatory, um, two definitely, I think the privileged and confidential information and the conflicts of interest you're well aware of. So I'm only gonna touch on four of them with just a little bit more detail. Um, mainly public records law. So anything that you do as an elected official or an appointed official or other boards, whether it's from a personal account, a professional account, as part of um, communication of a planning board or any of the other, if you are communicating, it is by the state of North Carolina determined to be a public record. So this policy, again, is designed to help um, with the boundaries of that, but so you should assume that anything that you do, whether it's your personal account or professional account, are public records and they're subject to inspection according to North Carolina public records law. This one, hopefully we won't have an issue with, but sometimes you have to have an issue before you realize there's an issue. And this one municipality did have this issue, so it, we included it in the policy. Please be mindful that if you post something on social media and those who sit on the dais with you, or whether it's another commission appointed or elected, and you engage in a conversation about that social media post, you're in essence part, having a meeting. And so you have to be careful that you don't draw the quorum, and basically violate open, open meetings law. So just some things that, again, probably would not happen, but we're trying to be very inclusive and robust with this policy in hopes that there would not be an issue. So if one elected official were to post and three others were to comment on it, um, it would be something that the town clerk would have to get involved in because it possibly could be a violation of open meetings law. A quick question in regards to that. So if if a, someone makes a post and you get three of us who may like said post? That's the gray area for the attorney. Okay. <laughs> and I would suggest not going down a slippery slope and avoiding that altogether. Okay. Um, I would like to backtrack, though, Kim, on one of the previous slides, if you'd go back. Just want to make sure that you understand that if you are posting, the post would have to relate to town business to actually become a public record. So if you are posting on social media purely in a personal nature, not about town business, not about your role as a board member, then it wouldn't necessarily become public record. Of course, we look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis. I just wanted to yes. point that out. And it would also relate to the next slide, which we were on regarding open meeting laws. If you and, and another commissioner are talking about something that has nothing to do with town-related business, and you like a post, you like their vacation picture, for example, that's not necessarily going to be something that could violate open meetings law. Yes, it did, would need to be town-related matters. And this one, um, it's just strong, it's, it's best practices um, for public officials, strongly encouraged to have separate accounts. 
You do not have to, but again, best practices suggest that you do have separate accounts. Um, because again, the slippery slope, if you have a professional account or I'm an elected official account and what you post, that helps keep the lines clear. And so it is strongly suggested. Now we do have, the town has a social media archiving program. We socially, we social media archive every single social media account that we have. Strongly suggested that any elected official who has an account tied to their role, that we need to do the same for your account. It's protective of you as well. Um, and the times that I've ever had to use that, it typically was because of a, a lawsuit. Not here, haven't been here that long. But previously, um, lawsuit with some information. They said, he said, she said. And so the archival um, file helped us um, sort that out. But it also is just a way to make sure that we are communicating and gathering information um, the best way so it, it and not to intermingle and also helps that if you want to post your um, birthday pictures or your holiday pictures and you know you're going to put that on your personal account but you're more concerned like for some of you who share the waste connections change of time or something like that it's very clear delineated on the information that is archived and it's just we just can attach that account to our social media archiving service so again, strongly encouraged for your protect, protection and as well as public record search. Reason being, if someone were to say or to be concerned about how you're communicating something on a social media site, if, if it's your official site, it's archived, we have record of it. If it's your personal site, you can talk about whatever you want, but we're not in that and it would be something that you would um, have to work if it was because of your um, position you would have to work with um, attorney sloop and we would work through that but it would also possibly open up your personal account for public records that I will leave that one with that one. it's it's just cleaner that way yes ma'am so like with Facebook my professional account is still linked to my main email with my personal one so how do you archive just one and not both we would have to work with the system the company and how we can get that um, again it's that's why it's really cleaner to have two separate accounts and figuring out the back end of that with the emails but it has less to do with emails as once something is posted, I can say on a town site, if I post it, if I edited it, all of it's archived, every bit of it. So if there was a concern that um, something was hidden or something was changed, it's all archived. There's, there's just like a public record, just like an email. Everything's there. So there's the, the evidence of you know everything is good, we haven't done anything incorrect, or we're not hiding anything. So it's just something to think about with your accounts as an elected official. Again, I know there's some, some other state statutes coming soon in January that will talk about um, other elected officials and influence and things like that. But to say that you're a supporter of something personally and then to say on a, an elected page that please go do this, it has some different connotations for some people and can have different connotations with public records law. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, um, I have a couple questions. On Facebook, you have the ability to restrict comments altogether and make it so no one can comment. I figure, in my opinion, that's equal opportunity offender, so we're okay there? I would say if you have, if you have a social media account which is intended to socially engage, um, to deny comments is almost contrary to the platform. However, that is an option. Um, it would not be an option we would use on any of the town sites. Understand that. But it is an option for your site. But yes, it's right. kind of. 
so, so all these questions are going to be in my world, but yeah, all of these questions spot. are going to be related to personal accounts. So yes. Um, I, I would just jump in. So yeah. that is definitely a better option than trying to pick and choose which comments to keep and delete or remove. So if you choose, you can, um, on your personal account, prohibit anyone from commenting. Right. But if you do allow comments, I just wouldn't pick and choose. Allow one, allow all. Yes. Totally agree. Um, on the producing production of these records, it sounds like you have a service that produces these records, so we don't have to, if, we would never get a FOIA request directly. Not directly, unless there was, uh, and this would be probably an attorney, unless there was a thought or a concern that there had been, then that would be a different path. But the service that we use is only on our social media accounts that are linked to that service. And at any point in time, I can pull up any parts of it. They can produce reports. They can show behaviors. It can do a lot of things. But it's the same thing as a public record request when uh, Ms. Pearson receives one, and she can pull all the emails. It, it operates the same way, but it's only on our social media sites. OK. And this is going to be related specifically to that those records. Do we have a list of which accounts you're actually tracking of ours? None right now. OK. <laughs> and <laughs> how far down this policy. rabbit hole do we go? My assumption is Facebook and Twitter are obvious choices, but do we go down Nextdoor? Do we go down TikTok? Do we, where do we go? Depending on what the content is, all could be subject to public records request. Interesting. OK. If you're using it for business purposes. Town-related specific. Yes. Yes. That's the extent of my questions for now. Any more? Any other questions at the moment? I may have one. Mm -hmm. I may have one. Um, yeah, Ms. Strickland, on my social media account, I monitor a lot of negative chatter, but I don't respond to that chatter just to stay in the loop as to what's going on out here. Is that something that I need to um, divulge or? No. no? Sir because it would be, again, the worst thing you can do, goes back to that first bullet, right. the elected officials, is to determine what stays and what goes on an account. Yeah, good. If you're allowing all comments and they all sit there, but it's the problem comes when people feel like they have been censored or their First Amendment rights have been violated because they, yeah. they said something that you didn't like and you deleted it, but someone else said something you agreed with and you kept it. That's where it gets a little messy. Well, actually, I'm under, under another name, so I just want to monitor what's going on. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and just one other, if I may, and it's, it's lighthearted, but it, please refrain if the policy is adopted from contacting um, town employees using their personal social media accounts. Um, I know sometimes you may not have a direct text number or you have a question about something. This, I would say in my previous employment, that was one of the questions, what's going on here? I saw this. Well, you can ask that in a text, just like you can ask that in an email, and it's a public record. If you ask that question on a social media account, it's a public record. So it, it doesn't change, it's just sometimes we go to an easy way to reach people or how we might wanna reach someone after hours or I'm, so I'm friends with them on Facebook and I wanna send them a quick message. Well, basically you are asking an employee a town-related business question. So it's best to, or if someone were to ask you a question on a social media account, it's best to just say, please contact and then they can tag us. If they're social media savvy, they know how to do it anyway. They can tag the town, and we can respond. Or you can send us an email if it needs a public response, and we will gladly send the information for you to share if we haven't already shared it. But it's really easy to just say, I, you know, I really need, I wonder why that pothole is still here. Well, if you're going to ask the question of our public works director, feel free to email him because it's a public record. Texting is a public record. If you ask that via his social media account, which I don't even know if he has one, don't wanna know if he has one, but it's the same premise. So that is added just as a, 
it's easy when we all like to get along and we know people and we know who to ask, but just please remember, if you're engaging a town employee in town business, it's a public record. And with that, just any other questions? I mean, there's no action asked, expected tonight, but just for, for future. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Kovacs. So it says, um, it, this isn't just us up here. You're talking about people on committed, we're talking about people on the 150th, on yes. greenways, on parks. So we're trying to, I don't have the right words. This is, that we're asking private citizens not to post information because they've been elected to a committee? No, um, it is to make sure that they are aware that what they post could be considered a public record if it's related to town business. It's not asking or restricting. It is just please make sure that you're aware. You would expect, there, if I may use the planning board, for example, um, you wouldn't want a planning board member to be posting about something that's on the planning board agenda on a personal note. Mm -hmm. um, and we would not be incorporating them into the, the social media archiving. It, it, this is to help them understand that when they engage in public business for the town, it is a public record, just like an email. So if they were going to put out an email about something, but so it's to help everyone, it's to protect, tech, really it's to protect everyone in understanding the dynamics and just knowing that, because you would expect a volunteer committee to be talking about their projects. So it is not in any way trying to say don't do that. It is trying to make sure everybody's aware of the public records law in North Carolina. And the, gener and the statute, and if just going back to that slide the statute does say every whether whether they're elected every board committee or commission so it's all of us interesting I'm, I, that makes me really uncomfortable but um i also some questions i wrote down while reading um were, uh, one of the phrases was favoritism and bias for or against any individual or group. That kind of, I, I don't know, that caught me by surprise. That saying, that made me feel like we can't applaud groups or, or things of that nature. We're, we're saying one town, one team, but then we're not going to applaud individuals or groups because it's favoritism or bias. Is there an example of that? I'm going by wording. I, know, I defer I to, but it's. There are some examples provided. And I think really it's meant to point out that we don't want um, comments that could be seen as discriminatory in nature, let's say to a particular religion or a particular protected class. Um, and I think that these comments are what we're seeking. If you see areas where we could wordsmith the policy to make it better, um, if it's not coming across as how it's meant to come across, we're, we're welcoming any feedback at this time. And this is a policy that we took um, from another jurisdiction. In fact, I think several jurisdictions have adopted a variation of this, um, but we're happy to change some of the wording. I, I think that that specific point, though, was more so meant that we don't want to have uh, defamatory or discriminatory um, comments posted. Okay, because on the other hand of that, I wrote down that it said avoid posts that seem like endorsements. And uh, on the same end of that, you know, we're talking about, or even me, I'm on the Lake Norman Chamber, you know, I'm, I want to talk about local businesses and things like that, but we don't want to endorse them. Yeah, and I, I think that we did provide some additional examples there as far as political endorsements um, and things of that nature, but we can definitely tighten up the wording based on commentary that the board provides. And my last question, I promise. So we have this, and I don't know if this is a silly question, but um, we have this in place and, and we're including a very large amount of people in it. So what happens if they go against this, what are, the, what are the ramifications of that? 
Well, on, on the slide that's up there right now for public records law, we actually listed it as instead of, um, we talk about an account created for the board committee. So for example, the downtown, if there was a social media account created for the downtown plan versus all the individuals on the downtown plan, they're volunteers, um, but they are appointed or they are selected. Some are voted. Um, one of the struggles is trying to find that area, and that's why we wanted to present it, to discuss it, to tweak it. Um, the municipalities that have these already in place um, are typically did so because they had a problem and were having to react to it. So the intent of this is to get ahead of any issues and not have that. Um, it is not to um, discourage anyone because really we use social media to, to reach a lot of people and we want to continue to do that. Um, but we don't want folks to get in trouble because they don't understand that in, the, in their performance of government business, there are some things that are different than if they are in the private sector. And for us, we're bound by that public records law. So um, again, I think the, eat, the, the casual way to say it is often we tell people, don't post something you wouldn't want your grandmother to read or you wouldn't. That's making light, but it's, it's similar. It really is just trying to help people and protect folks from getting into trouble instead of having to dig out of trouble. Um, I can say that the city of Durham, when they did their policy, it took them several years. I hesitate to say that. Please, please don't let's please don't wait several years. But they were in the middle of some angst when they were trying to create their policy, and it's best to have a policy to to move forward and as as a, a best practice, but not to. It's not intended to keep people from sharing their thoughts. It's not intended to keep people from communicating. It's really to protect people and help them understand the public record laws of North Carolina. That's mostly where my questions were coming from is we want to promote conversation and we want to get our residents involved, but I also don't want them to be afraid that their public accounts are going to be pulled into public record or well, and they're going to have to have their public accounts archived because the planning board members generally don't have a, a separate Facebook or, right. or things and like that. And we're not looking for, the, again, that's why we encourage the officials, especially this board, to have separate accounts so that your personal and your work or your town business are clearly delineated so that there is not a mess because it does get intertwined, it gets complicated, and it's just easier to have that line. So, you know, for instance, if you choose not to have comment, allow comments on your account, that's you. Town can't do that. Um, and, but it's also letting people know that when they do comment on public accounts that are government related, and now I'm talking again about town sites now, not about personal sites, but they are held according to the retention policy set by North Carolina. So just as if it's an email that Ms. Pearson is keeping track of, all of that is archived based on the same schedule and under the same rules. Yes, ma'am. Um, so one of the things in this that concern me is the expressions of favoritism, um, especially where it says like political affiliation. I'm the only unaffiliated sitting up here right now. And I don't feel like my fellow commissioners, the mayor, anybody on a committee shouldn't be able to promote their party of their choice. Um, and they should show favoritism. If that's where their heart leads them, God bless you. Um, and then, and I see people taking advantage of stuff like this because I can see people with the world being so divided saying, not to pick on Lance, but Lance is a very proud Democrat, and I could see somebody going back to this policy and attacking Lance or people doing the same to Derek for being conservative. And I don't want to set other people up for personal attacks for having their God-given right to express their feelings about their political affiliation. Um, like that really upsets and bothers me because I feel like we're stepping towards censorship. And then even, I love four letter words. <laughs> and uh, where it says profane language or acronyms for profane language. Um, 
I watch what I say on my Facebook because my grandparents are my Facebook friends and I'm not going to offend them ever. Um, but there are other people, committee people, who have volunteered to give their time freely. If they want to use whatever words they're allowed to use, I don't feel like that should be something that we reprimand them for on their personal accounts and it says personal account. And maybe I'm getting too in the weeds with this, but those are those little things that really stand out to me because I could see somebody on one far end of the spectrum, here it comes Pride Month, you put up something about Pride Month and then someone's saying, you're showing favoritism, you know, towards, so I want to be really careful with that because while we think this is something that can help us, this is also something that we can use to disarm ourselves from being able to be unique individuals. So I'm not really ready to make any kind of drastic actions. I feel like, especially without Rob being here, we need to really, really take a chance because once you set something like this in stone, it's going to be almost impossible to walk back, even if we find negatives further down the road. Well, Commissioner Phillips, we're not going to make any decisions okay. tonight. This was just a presentation. I would say, I would encourage, because I know we've got another presentation to take on as well, um, but I would say continue to jot down your notes, send those over to Ms. Strickland, to Ms. Sloop, um, and let's continue to refine this. Um, this doesn't ha need to happen tonight. It doesn't need to happen the next meeting, but we do need to at some point solidify some things. Um, so nothing tonight, but I mean, it's really more of our first glimpse into this, um, and I think that's a lot to unpack. Yes. And uh, remember, there are two separate policies: so how we use and what we can use. What we can say on a town site is different. What you can say on your personal sites. The profanity and stuff gets blocked coming in, but we also would not use it on a town site going out. So please know that there is a definite distinction between how we use a town site versus how you can use your personal site or your professional site. Certain things we would never, we wouldn't do. So let me ask this quick question, because I know Commissioner Phillips brought up, um, where was your line? Um, favoritism and political affiliation um, if you're promoting your political affiliation on your own personal page that has nothing to do with the town correct right. it's if you have a um, commissioner page that is that's where you do your town business and where you're promoting town town events town policy that's where you would not want to do that that's the delineation, correct? I would, I would say, and I have to defer to the legal because she's shaking her head. I would say it's a bit more good. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You, both, you Everyone that's elected have their beliefs. You have your platforms. You have all of that. And you should not lose that just because you're elected and you're on a social media site. So most of the details that are listed in that policy are for town sites and how we use our sites not how others use the sites but because it's you should not have to put some things out there it depends upon which portion portion you're looking at let's continue to, yes. let's just go ahead and, and table the this unless there's any additional co uh, conversation I, I have at the moment one. yes um the the first policy went over yes. hr are they involved with this they were okay cool and that's actually where the age specifics came from. But this one doesn't have the age like in a like a demographic so that's why I was like huh? It was a protected class. Okay. That's why. That actually came, several pieces came directly out of the existing personnel policy for the town. So they were involved. Yes. And I basically say uh, I'm not giving you my information. So what's, what can be done? When you say I'm not giving you my information, you mean that... You did a public records request on my post, even though everybody knows I don't Facebook or do any of that stuff. Um, but um, I'm on a committee, and I'm saying all sorts of stuff, town business, et cetera. I was appointed. And you asked, you know, you asked for me to give you that information. I choose not to give you that information because I think it's my personal choice, et cetera, so I'm not giving it to you. They're likely the going to be subpoenaed. Hmm? They're likely going to be subpoenaed. Okay. I just want to make that, because one of the worries sort of I worry about is 
how are we going to be able to get that information from if we go train or educate these various committees out there with this information there ain't no way we can track that unless they give it to us and we don't want that's i think that's the important piece we're not looking to go tag all of these account personal accounts it is a guideline and again if there is a page or a social media account associated with something specific, the downtown plan, the 2040 plan, all of those plans. We would never want someone, volunteer or staff, to start posting on there that was of discriminatory nature to someone in town. So think of it more as a, as a guideline, as guide rails to help people conduct business in a respectful way. Is this also an opportunity for us to educate these individuals so that they're then aware that what they're posting out there if they're posting from a town which they wouldn't be see that's right, the, right they wouldn't be that would be person those are personal right. things but if you're speaking on if you're saying as the chair of the planning board as the chair of this as it, that's where people get a little uncomfortable but this is more designed to just say let's have some guidelines in place because here's some legal ramifications. We don't want people going out there and deleting things because they don't like stuff. So let me ask this question then. If we have, let's say we have a, um, someone from public art, just it's a hypothetical, and they're out there and maybe they've posted and they're soliciting information. Hey, do y'all like this artwork? That's fine. That's in the, con they're conducting the business of their committee. Right. So then that, but that is then subject to records. It, it would be not from us, but if someone were to say, I think this person who represents your commission is deleting everything they don't agree with, or then it becomes a different one, discussion. We're promoting one artwork over another. I mean, I'm how deep do we go here? But I, that's, I would prefer to stay a little bit higher level on that. Okay. But because that's what you want them. <coughs> that's what you've elected them to do. That's what you want new ideas. What people can get in trouble with is if it's, again, it's that um, viewpoint discrimination or First Amendment is I'm only going to allow people to agree with me to comment on whatever I do. Okay. But it's if, not about disagreement. If they're talking town business, no matter whether it's personal, or whether it's their professional or whatever account, then it's subject to the public records request, right? Which would be any even without this policy, that is true. Okay. Even Just without make the sure policy, that is that. that is a public record. Okay. All right. So, any additional questions? Let's let's come back and circle back around, and maybe we can wordsmith a little bit and make it palatable for everyone. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams, we did not leave you a lot of time. No worries. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, some of you have heard some of this already. Uh, this will be, uh, for some of you, the, the first time we're talking about the American Rescue Plan. And uh, we've got some additional information um, which is really timely for this update. Um, you'll see, uh, it's government, we love our acronyms. You'll see ARP, you'll see ARPA, you'll see SLFRF, the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund. Uh, FRF Fiscal Recovery Fund, CLFRF, Coronavirus Local Fiscal Relief Fund. Um, it's a lot, but it's all the same thing. Uh, and it's, it's different than the uh, Coronavirus Relief Funds. Some of you may recall last year we had like three or four weeks to figure out how are we going to spend this money. Uh, and we had to go ask for it from Mecklenburg County. Um, with the American Rescue Plan, we have until December 31st, 2024 to um, incur and obligate the funds, and then we've got until December 31st, 2026 to actually spend that money. So three years to obligate, five years to spend. Uh, slide there shows the, uh, the period that we can cover. We can go back to March 3rd, but this program is forward-looking, so it goes uh, between that period all the way to the end of that three years, uh, December 31st, 2024. Down there at the bottom, the funding to the town, we were a little bit surprised when uh, Treasury came out in May with the interim, interim final rule, and it gave the town $4.8 million. We thought we were going to be funded as a non-entitlement unit, and a uh, big thanks to Representative Alma Adams' office. Uh, thought maybe we could you know, get that rectified through the state, through the state budget and the money that they got. Uh, and so we got $12 million when the state budget got approved at the end of November, I guess mid-November. Um, but we didn't know how we were going to get it, what that process was going to be. So. 
that's sort of what, what spurred part of this uh, presentation to you today. Um, I'll give you a reminder on the allowable expenditures. You can use it to address public health, address negative economic impacts, replace lost revenue. Uh, and the lost revenue one is unique in that um, you don't have any, any strings necessarily on the uses of the money. Uh, so we could pretty much provide general government services uh, with, to the extent of the funds that were identified as lost revenue. But all the other ones kind of have to fit in one of these buckets. The public health, the negative economic impacts, premium pay for uh, public health and safety workers, and then you can do infrastructure. But infrastructure is limited to water and sewer, which also includes stormwater, uh, and broadband. And so uh, no roads, none of the other things, the large ticket items that we've got right now. Um, but, but as it stands right now with the interim final rule, these are, are what's allowed. There are a number of ineligible expenses. Uh, you can't borrow money. You can't use it to repay loans. You can't use it for uh, economic development purposes, litigation costs. You can't match uh, federal funds with these. Uh, you can't uh, replenish your reserves. North Carolina, uh, as you know, everything is, is dictated by the state statute. So uh, we've got the interim final rule and the American Rescue Plan that says you can do X. But we've also got to line that up with where North Carolina general statutes give us authority under state law. And then we also have to align the federal compliance with the state law compliance. Um, and I think Emily probably enjoys playing in this sandbox. Uh, I feel like I've been drinking from a fire hose trying to figure out <laughs> where all this stuff goes. Um, and these slides, uh, we borrowed them from the School of Government. Um, and kind of want to just give you sort of a way that we're thinking about uh, potential projects as we continue to see and learn. Uh, from the 4.8 to the 12, uh, the process we need to go through to try to figure out, you know, is it allowable, is it eligible, does it comply with state law, does it comply with federal law? Um, so think about it as a funnel and come up with a project, ask is there state law authority, ask is some or all of the portion of the project within an ARP category, and then we gotta figure out what are the compliance, the justification, the reporting, and the documentation requirements. And again, within that framework of, is it a health issue? Is it a negative economic impact? And then there's a lot of emphasis, sorry, I take this off. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis in the American Rescue Plan about serving disproportionately negatively impacted areas, groups, communities, uh, households, or individuals. Um, this is a slide from the School of Government. They have done a, a great job trying to train us all up on, on this legislation, uh, especially as things have evolved and changed since the summer. Um, and you see there the, the broadest state law authority kind of applies to things like our facilities. We can go and we can update our facilities to be more um, COVID friendly or more um, resistant to spreading disease. Uh, community programs, your households and individuals. As you get towards the top in terms of services we can provide to small businesses and nonprofits and broadband, a lot more limited in your state authority. Uh, allowable costs must be reasonable and necessary. Um, allocable and consistent treatment, so like costs must be treated consistently, um, and that, that comes out of uniform guidance. Uh, last year, uh, uh, some legislation was passed that uh, required updates to uniform guidance, which we're in the process of updating right now, um, but you know, there's a lot to uniform guidance. I'll skip ahead real quick and I'll go back, uh, but uniform guidance, um, and Emily is working on a number of policies to bring you um, not only updating that existing um, uniform guidance policy, but also other things like if we sought to hire a consultant or some other assistance to help us, we would need a policy to um, govern the HR side of, uh, of that assistance. Um, and a number of these you'll probably see in the coming weeks um, and certainly hear more about at our upcoming uh, planning workshop. Um, but we've got we've to update our tools in our toolbox to make sure that we've got everything that will govern our procurement compliance and the documentation that will be required. Um, so uh, I'm sure you guys have gotten hit up by residents and, and organizations that are curious about how we might be spending our money. Um, and, and so when you're thinking about it, whatever we spend has to fit into one of these seven expenditure categories. So public health, negative economic impacts, services to disproportionately impacted communities, premium pay, infrastructure, revenue replacement, or administrative costs. 
Bobby, um, I just wanted to jump in for one second uh, and point out, I think you had noted this on a previous slide, but even if it is something that's allowable at the federal level per the interim guidance and even the final guidance that comes out, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have state law authority to spend money on it. Now, I also wanted to point out, um, you do list here as number three, services to disproportionately impacted communities. Unfortunately, we do not have any qualified census tracts, which would allow us a presumption to say that that cost is eligible, presumptively so. So we would have to come up with very thorough documentation to show that it is in fact eligible lacking those qualified census tracts. We, we, do, um, we do have the ability to define a geography, uh, but we do have to put some data to represent um, how we're making that determination. I mentioned lost revenue. The interim final rule spells out how you calculate that. Um, preliminary calculations suggest that, that our three-year three growth rate uh, is 7.51%, um, and that is the three years prior to the pandemic. And so using that uh, growth rate, we estimate our lost revenue for calendar year 2020 was just over $1.8 million. And so that $1.8 million um, would get broad latitude in how the board could use it, how the town could use it. Um, you know, we still couldn't do any of those things that were ineligible on the previous slide. Um, but we could use it for general government services. The only caveat there is you still have to use uh, your uniform guidance. You still have to play by the same rules uh, for the use of the funds. And then we also have to be able to report back to the Treasury that we're not using those funds for any of the ineligible items. Uh, I mentioned before, no rush to spend the funds. I'm just kind of looking ahead. Um, we're still waiting on a final rule. Uh, we thought we might get that before the end of the year. Um, it's been updated a couple of times, but uh, not since uh, November uh, have we seen any change on that. Um, before the end of the, the 2021, there was a Senate bill that had bipartisan support that passed. It would aim to increase flexibility on what's treated as lost revenue. So you could use funds for um, other infrastructure projects like roads and, and other things. And knowing that we've got a $100 million capital improvement plan, you know, I, I figure that's something that you guys would uh, definitely want us to continue watching. It is in the House. It does have over 100 um, sponsors on both sides, but it has not um, to date gotten on a calendar for any type of, of action. Um, it, you know, it's strongly encouraged. This is the one time that, that every government's gotten money. Um, you know, a lot of encouragement in the interim final rule on soliciting public input uh, to you know, figure out how the public feels about priorities, the eligible expenditure categories. Uh, until we have a final rule, um, you know, I don't know, I think of it a little bit like you know, moving the yardstick. The rules are this, and we went out and asked the public, how do we spend X, but then the rules change, and then they want us to spend it a different way. Um, you know, we want to be careful just so that we're um, going out at the right time with the right accurate information. Um, but ultimately, public input will be very important with this. Um, interest earned on our ARPA funds. Typically, when you get federal funds, any interest earned, you have to send back. This time around, you don't. You get to keep any interest that's earned. Um, interest rates aren't great these days, but you know we'll take all we can get. Um, I mentioned before updates to town policies, and then the uh, the state fiscal recovery fan, fund plan. Uh, we got got an email from them back before the holidays um, asking us to put together a plan on how we were going to spend the $12 million, and they asked for it to be due back you know, mid-January. And uh, we've got to call with them tomorrow to, uh, to talk a little bit more about this. And it certainly sounds like an extension of that is, uh, is possible um, and very plausible from our standpoint. Uh, but the NC Pandemic Recovery Office will govern that process. Um, and so here, just kind of note the the, the timing that they, they gave us. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but I wanted just to give you kind of an idea of what they're asking us for. Um, and this equates to um, what the larger cities and the other states have been asked to give uh, in terms of recovery plans to the US Treasury in order to get their funds. So um, they, they want an overview of each project that we might be thinking of, a description of that project, how it addresses that those framework items that we mentioned. Uh, projection of, of quarterly spending, a timeline for doing so, partners, um, if the, the project is serving an economically disadvantaged community. Um, and then again, the, the assumptions there that Emily alluded to, um, we do not. We did, as of 2010 or 2020, we did not have any qualified census tracts. So that um, limits a little bit of how that, that broad span of activities could be 
um, utilize, but um, we've been sort of brainstorming other ways to, to try to work around that. Um, and then the emphasis in the ARP about um, designing projects with equity in mind, they, they would ask us, the state would, to address that as well. Um, and then how do you plan to incorporate written oral um, or other forms of input? And if, you know, if we've got a very short timeline to give them this plan, um, it's hard to speak to how we're going to incorporate the public's input. So um, that's another, an, another area that, that we'll express concern to them about. Um, Non-discrimination with the Civil Rights Act. Um, and then there's, there's emphasis on uh, evidence-based interventions. Uh, you know, this money, they want to know how it's being used. They also want to know the impact it's having. So they're um, placing particular emphasis on coming up with evidence-based interventions and then program evaluation to figure out, hey, we're putting aside this money to accomplish you know, these goals. And at the end of the day, um, you know, did, did we meet those goals? Um, there's also room in there for pilot projects um, to kind of allow some creativity and encourage creativity. Um, the, the next one down, the infrastructure category. Um, you, you, know, you don't have um, the, the, the rigorous evidence uh, criteria associated with that, but there is a particular emphasis on strong labor standards. So we would use things like Davis-Bacon for prevailing wages to make sure that we're paying um, you know, a, a very competitive local wage, and then also would probably add emphasis on local hiring uh, just to make sure local folks are getting uh, opportunities. Uh, and then they have a, a, a performance logic, goals and performance logic model that they want for each, um, each project that we put in our plan. Um, and, and again, this is something we're all wrapping our heads around, but we wanted to, as you're hearing things, thinking of projects, um, this applies to the 12 million. The 4.8, not quite as, as much on, on this side. Um, let's see, I'm almost done. I tried to go quick. I apologize for going fast. Um, but uh, we've got a call with North Carolina Pandemic Recovery Office tomorrow, so we will hopefully have a much better handle on sort of what's expected of us and then what we'll be uh, bringing back to you in, in terms of you know, recommendations, questions, things that you'd like us to vet. Think about that funnel. If you have ideas, send them to us. We'll put them through the funnel. We'll figure out what we can do. Um, and then potentially eligible projects. Um, you know, with, with the pandemic, cost of everything has gone up. Uh, Stormwater and erosion control uh, have, have gone up quite a bit in terms of other uh, aspects of our road projects. Uh, we've already got as much as $10 million in stormwater and erosion control projects associated with various road projects, various stream restoration projects in town uh, that could be potentially, um, you know, you, some of these funds could be used for. You've got the lost revenue calculation that could be used on general government uh, uh, expenses. And then you've got, um, you know, updates to town facilities to uh, respond to COVID-19 public health. Uh, you know, trying to make sure that, that we're safe, that our airflow, um, the, the filters, everything like that is uh, as safe as possible. And then um, whatever the board and community priorities are related to those expenditure categories. And those are things that we'll be trying to ascertain a little more as we move forward. But um, again, and this is sort of the guidance we've, we've continued to hear from School of Government and every other organization is that you know coronavirus relief fund is a rush to spend the money. Uh, we've got three years to obligate, five years to spend these funds. We want to make sure that we do it in the in the right way. So I know that was quick, but no, we we did give you a very limited time to go through it. You did well. Any, any questions or welcome emails, calls? You know, we're like I said, we're still working through this, and we'll have a better idea where we stand with the state tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Bobby, thank you for that, that presentation. I, I believe that we need to at least have an hour. Um, you gave us a lot of information. It was rushed. But um, I think you lost me within the first two, 10 minutes. OK. Um, and this is very important. This is $12 million. And we're looking at different types of communities where we can spend this money. So um, I would appreciate maybe if we, don't, if we don't discuss it, maybe we can discuss it in the retreat that we might have coming up. Since, uh, to uh, uh, see how we can really deep dive into this. But I appreciate it. Thank you for the information that you gave us. Um, this was just a quick overview for us to get us caught up to speed as to what he's currently working on. And then we will certainly be diving a, a whole lot deeper as we continue to work to figure out how we're going to spend those dollars. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Appreciate you. Um, we have about two minutes before we go into regular board meetings.